This week on Arizona Illustrated, here to help. We're a group that's just here to support each other and try our best to um, meet each other's needs. Selling water. It is inevitable that more water will move from a lower value use to a higher value use. And myth and the West. The historical West and the mythological West are two very different things. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Today, we're surrounded by 49 acres of lush desert garden at Tohono Chul. And like many local institutions, the grounds are currently closed to the public and the staff is busy with preparations for visitor safety. While we have the grounds to ourselves, we continue to take precautions to keep each other safe, including wearing or having masks on hand. And the need for such precautions is still pressing. Arizona continues to report a high rate of positive cases of coronavirus, with the total number eclipsing 150,000. And our state is second only to Puerto Rico in the percentage of people testing positive per capita. Not surprisingly, the number of beds in hospital intensive care units needed to care for people suffering from COVID-19 also remains a critical situation. For more coronavirus-related information and resources to help you and your family to stay safe, visit news.azpm.org. You may have noticed that each week we are bringing you an excerpt from our weekly public affairs program, Arizona 360. This week, not all masks are created equal. Lorraine Rivera recently discussed the best and the worst with University of Arizona researcher Amanda Wilson. So in our research, we looked at how wearing a mask can reduce your infection risk. And we used data from the literature describing how different materials compare in their ability to filter the virus, um, the volume of air that people breathe over certain periods of time. And our research showed that masks like N99 and 95 surgical masks do the most to reduce infection risk. But of course, we want to reserve those for people who are, you know, on the front lines of this, who are in healthcare. But obviously, for those of us, you know, at home who have to go to the grocery store, go into public, we want some option other than those masks. So some of the non-traditional mask materials we looked at included vacuum cleaner bags and tea towels. And those were the two top performers after those more traditional masks. So just to give some numbers on that, we, with our models, saw that the vacuum cleaner bag reduced infection risks for 20 minute exposures by 58%. For a 30 second exposure, it reduced infection risk by 83%. And our next best was the tea towel, which reduced infection risks for a 20 minute exposure by 41%. And then for a 30 second exposure, it reduced infection risk by 63%. So these non-traditional materials can still have a big impact on reducing our risk. And to be clear, what's the effectiveness or the percentage rate of success for the N95 or a surgical mask? So those masks in our model had infection risk reductions on the order of like 90% or 94%, depending upon the duration or the amount of time that someone's in a contaminated environment. Okay, many of us, though, are wearing cloth masks. What's the percentage of success for those? Right. So it really depends on the cloth. So, you know, a tea towel or some some type of towel you might have in your kitchen that has really densely knitted fibers, that's going to be better than something like a t-shirt or a scarf. And I've seen some pictures of people, you know, sort of living out the Wild West. They have these scarves that sort of drape down over their face. And we found that scarves in our model actually offered the lowest infection risk reduction of those different material types. So to give some perspective on that, again, the vacuum cleaner bag, reduced infection risks for 30 second exposures by 83%, but the scarf reduced infection risks by 44%. So almost half. Amanda Wilson, a researcher here at the University of Arizona. Thanks for your insight. Thank you for having me. Arizona is one of the fastest growing states in the U.S. It's also one of the country's top producers of fresh market vegetables, lettuce, alfalfa, and other crops. Both growing cities and growing crops require a reliable source of water and must rely on it to be there in the future. 
There's a pending water sale that pits agricultural communities along the Colorado River against those in metropolitan Phoenix. And it may be setting the stage for future battles over the world's most precious resource. There is something anthropological about water that people get. They get that it is a magic commodity, that it's something they know they should be worried about. It is a tribal commodity. The people with whom we share water are us. The people who are trying to take our water away are them. And usually that's one state versus another, but in a circumstance like this, I think people on the river see us in central Arizona as the them. I refer to Cibola, Arizona as kind of like its own diamond in the rough, so to speak. The Colorado River runs right through there. It's surrounded by cotton fields and a lot of alfalfa that, that grows down there. And I think it's it maybe has a population a little over 300. So it's a very small knit community. And we've been there for 26 years and I love it. <laughs> Cibola is an unusual little pocket that is in Arizona. But the only very easy way to get there without four-wheel drive and going over a mountain is to go into California and come back across the Colorado River into the Cibola area. GSC Farms is owned by a company called Greenstone, and Greenstone buys agricultural property. They buy it both for its real estate value and for the value that the water has. Greenstone is a product of a hedge fund group that's looking to capitalize on uh, buying and selling water rights and moving water rights in the West. Queen Creek is a up and coming community in the Southeast Valley of Maricopa County in the Northwest portion of Pinell County. It's a very vibrant community, a lot of young families, and it's one of the fastest growing communities, not just in the state of Arizona, but in the nation. About 99% of our water is all groundwater from a very large aquifer that Queen Creek uh, resides over. Hopefully what you're doing is balancing the basin. So if you remove 10,000 acre feet of water, 10,000 acre feet is supposed to be returned to the aquifer through uh, recharge projects. 10 years ago, the cost was about $240 an acre foot. The forecast is for it to go up well over $1,000 an acre foot. So we, we started to think that if we could control our own destiny, that we might be able to um, provide a more reliable uh, supply of water at a reduced price to our residents. It really is better water management and better water stewardship for the city to identify supplies, renewable water supplies, to meet current and future demand. And so it's not surprising that cities would be highly motivated to do that. It's also not surprising that there'd be a lot of resistance to having water moved off the river and wheeled through the CAP for delivery to those cities that want those supplies. La Paz County has officially opposed this potential water transfer. It just seems like this is a big water grab for from the metropolitan areas and rural Arizona is being targeted.
farmers use between 70 and 80 percent of the west water uh, one third of that irrigated water is with flood irrigation literally just turn on the tap and flood the field it's very inefficient and a lot of the the irrigation water is used to grow low value crops like alfalfa so there's this kind of perfect storm of a need for the urban users to get a little more water and when you talk about more water, the only place where the water is is, is is in the agricultural community. If you're setting in the city, it's easy to say growing alfalfa is not a good use of water. Who's to say building more cardboard houses in the edge of Phoenix is a good use of water? to take water from agriculture production off of the Colorado River permanently forever and ever and move that water to other parts of the state to support growth. But when's that going to stop? Are we going to completely wipe out ag production? I think it highlights the big decision that we have to make as a state about how we grow and where we get the water for growth. The history of Arizona and the history of the West is all about moving water around. Phoenix wouldn't be here if we didn't move water. Tucson would have dried up long ago. And when the Western Arizona communities say that this is the camel's nose under the tent, I think what they're really saying is, we feel really vulnerable. And it's quite legitimate. There are good reasons why they feel vulnerable. A slight reduction in agricultural consumption solves the municipal and industrial supply problem. So I think we need to have intelligent regulation by the state to ensure that the rural communities are protected, that the environment is protected, it has to be done sensibly, but sensible regulation is consistent with a certain amount of water marketing. Without importing some new water sources into central Arizona, at the current rates of growth we've had, we probably have a decade or a little more left until we start bumping up against some fairly serious limits. The question of limits is a question of choices. This is all about how do you want to use the water you have. We need to decide in this state, are we going to have a balance of valuable ag production versus growth in the cities? We can take all the water to the cities, but that doesn't mean they're going to grow forever. This particular transfer will be the starting point of us making a hard decision of what we're going to do in the future. These kinds of transfers will happen. They will happen. It is inevitable that more water will move from a lower value use to a higher value use. People characterize that for years as being in the West, water flows toward money. That is largely true. I, I prefer to say water flows toward people. Urban populations need water and that is the history of the West. Cowboys and Indians, black-hatted outlaws against white-hatted lawmen settling the West. These iconic scenes of the 19th century American West are in fact imagined. 
Some scholars describe it as the most imagined region of the American landscape. This fabricated past affects us. It affected Tucson and Cody Young, who continues to examine the myth and the West. My father was a Hollywood stuntman. After he got out of the war, he kicked around Hollywood wanting to be an actor, and he fell into stunt work, mostly doing underwater stunts. He was like the third person to put on the creature of the Black Lagoon costume, so he was the creature at one point, but he fell into westerns. So he did a lot of great westerns, a lot of John Ford westerns, John Wayne westerns, worked with Howard Hawks, and he was instrumental in building up Old Tucson. For over 50 years, Old Tucson Studio has been an important part of the magic of movie making. And at one time or another, almost every major star has walked these historic streets. Over 20 live shows are performed at Old Tucson Daily, including the most authentic gunfight reenactments anywhere. So I was born into this context, you know, and I was raised out at Old Tucson. I was a child actor. I did, you know, jobs out at Old Tucson. So, I mean, the Western is something that's just intrinsically part of my character and life. But as I start to study it, when I come to school and I start to confront ideas of white privilege and the media representing only a specific point of view and that being a very white point of view. And I can see how the Western has achieved this sort of huge building block in this attitude. The West was being mythologized even as it was being enacted. So the historical West and the mythological West are two very different things. And it's this legend that speaks to a lot of intrinsic values of the country, of freedom, of individuality. Certainly uh, an ideal notion of masculinity is uh, perpetuated by the Western. And, but mostly uh, above all, it's a very Anglo-centered view of manifest destiny. There is an effacement of people of color. This effacement of an entire segment of non-white culture leads people to believe that there were no black cowboys, when in fact one out of every four cowboy in the West was black. White pioneers coming to the West already were coming to a culture, a cowboy culture established by Mexican vaqueros. That the West is this really complicated uh, collision and imbrication of cultures. But I mean, we don't see that. The most egregious thing you could really level against the Western is the way it treats indigenous peoples. They are an obstacle. They are embodiments of the savagery of the West that needs to be tamed to make sure that American civilization comes through. You don't see their point of view. They emerge out of the wilderness as hostile. There's no real talk about why they're hostile. They're just a problem that needs to be solved, and usually through violence. There's this there's, there's idea of justified violence to enable uh, the coming of America. While a lot of Westerns kind of towed the line as far as uh, reinforcing dominant ideology, there have always been Westerns that have questioned that ideology, whether that was, it was through gender, like one of my favorites is Johnny Guitar uh, with Joan Crawford, films questioning the white-centric focus of the genre, Posse, a 1993 movie directed by Mario Van Peebles, is using the Western to say something. I'm an instructor with the School of Film, Theater, and Television. I specialize in film history. The whole class is designed to introduce students, these are film and television students, to the Western genre because many of them perhaps haven't been exposed to it. They don't really know its importance and it's really designed to let them know just how influential the genre is as far as establishing not only a form of American mythology, but how it influences contemporary cinema today. As much as I love the genre, it is problematic. It does have a number of things that 
speak to the problems we're experiencing today. Perhaps no event in recent history has affected us more profoundly than the coronavirus pandemic. It has impacted and motivated us all in unpredictable ways. It motivated the people you're about to meet to help others. We're inside of Tall Boys. It's a bar and restaurant that's been closed since the early onset of the COVID pandemic. Since it's closed, it is now the headquarters of the Tucson Food Share. Tucson Food Share, it's a mutual aid project. We're giving out food to anyone who asks for it. We try to also um, make it possible for anyone to contribute. Nobody makes money off of it. And so much of the stuff that we share is donated. It's, it's a very low expense project. So if people who do have money donate what they would otherwise spend at a grocery store and get their food here, then it enables this project to really go on. Civic Produce is a distribution company focused on local and small scale production in Southern Arizona. Uh, we buy food from about 30 different farmers right now, and we're distributing to 35 to 40 restaurants on a good day. When COVID hit, we all sort of got freaked out. A lot of folks were running to the grocery stores to like fill up their pantries, and grocery stores were, you know, the shelves were empty. Meanwhile, we had farmers and their walk-ins and coolers and fields were filled with food and all of our phones started ringing like crazy. So we have shifted almost completely over to delivering to the doorsteps of families here in Tucson. When we first launched Pivot Direct, it was just one Instagram post and we had 360 people sign up in 48 hours. We're busier than we've ever been. I am a staunch anti-capitalist that is running a business. So it's kind of this push and pull within the company to say, how are we meeting the needs of the community? How are we breaking down systems of oppression within agriculture? But then also, how are we getting as much money to farmers as we possibly can? We buy a ton of food from farmers that we just give away. And we use the wealth that we have in the, our customer base to subsidize or facilitate that. What we really want to do is give money to farmers but oh, there's a lot of people out there that need to eat. So the Facebook group is called Tucson Mutual Aid, and it is essentially just that. So we encourage anybody in the Tucson community, regardless of area of town, to make themselves available um, to provide aid or to receive aid if at any point in time they may need it. We're a group that's just here to support each other and try our best to um, meet each other's needs. I'm a social worker. I've been a social worker in this uh, in Tucson for about the past 12 years. I think it's really magnified those social issues that folks ordinarily experience if they're under-resourced or they're more impacted by systemic pitfalls. Now, since everyone's being impacted, it's like, oh, this is my issue. <laughs> there is this is something critical that we need to look at here. Can you imagine if we had started recording? <laughs> Uh, I started recording. <laughs> Me and uh, Monica are roommates, and when the ordinance happened, we were concerned about people experiencing homelessness, not having masks. We started Tucson Mask Share. We are a grassroots organization that is made up of any person who is willing to join us and participate by making donations. We take those donations and we distribute them to community partners that we identify as having a need. We were expecting three people maybe to show up and it was like 25 cars that rolled through. 
donating like over 600 masks mm -hmm. um, just in that one drive. Just in a and few so hours, yeah. We recently received a donation of a thousand masks from Christy Dawn. Viruses are completely neutral, but our reactions to them are not. We can choose what our response is individually and as a society. And I think that mutual aid is this wonderful chance for us to fill in the gaps. That's how I think about mutual aid, right? It's that concept of shifting from charity to solidarity. Through a community-run mutual aid project, people can hopefully feel a lot more security knowing that their whole community is looking out for itself and looking out for each other. We don't like to determine who does and doesn't deserve the food. It's actually really important to us that this be a cross-class community. Our long-term hope for this is that this remains a community food resource. I think it's a really beautiful thing when people work together, and I think everyone knows that in their hearts. The more work we do in non-periods of disaster, or what do you call that, normal life, to build the resilience of our local food system, the better off we're gonna be when that happens again. The most rapid response and the most effective response is often mutual aid. The systems at play should take a lesson in like what does mutual aid and what does grassroots organizing really provide the people. Navigating personal space in the era of social distancing can be difficult. Here's a tip from our series, Coronavirus Pandemic, What You Need to Know. Approaching another person uh, is a common social behavior, but in the current context, social distancing is key to reducing transmission. So the question is, what do we do when someone appears to be violating this behavior or getting a little too close for comfort? The key, I think, is to act. ACT, something we can all remember. Acknowledge, control, and thank. Acknowledge the person's desire to engage. Control the distance. If they approach, pull back a little bit. And thank, thank them for respecting your boundaries. Many times people simply approach because it's the social nicety to do, but forgetting that the current context really precludes those kinds of interactions. So the next time someone approaches you, remember to act for their health and yours. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Stay safe. We'll see you next week.